And all God's people said, Amen. let us rise and worship the triune God. The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. Hebrews 3 verse 3 says, for this man was counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who hath builded the house hath more honor than the house. So lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Our God and Father, you sit above all the turmoil, all the hubbub, all the chaos. Your hand has shaken the world, yet the house which your son has built remains unmoved. Though we've been humbled, isolated, and brought low, we look to your goodness alone in our current trial. When we were gathered in our homes, you heard our praise. When we assembled in a mighty host of motor vehicles, you delighted in our honked amens. Now that we have been restored to gathering in person, you joy over us. Whether your people are scattered by disease or persecution, or whether they meet in a humble country church or an ancient cathedral, you receive our praise when we bring it in faith. So, Almighty God, we bring you our service of praise in the blood of Jesus, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, world without end. And amen. amen. Our text this morning is Malachi chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. I have loved you, says the Lord, yet you say, in what way have you loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother, says the Lord? Yet Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated, and laid waste his mountains and his heritage for the jackals of the wilderness. Even though Edom has said, we have been impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places, thus says the Lord of hosts. They may build, but I will throw down. They should be called the territory of wickedness and the people against whom the Lord will have indignation forever. Your eyes shall see and you shall say, the Lord is magnified beyond the order, border of Israel. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we ask for your blessing now as we come to your word. Open our ears, soften our hearts that we might hear and obey. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we'll be starting a series now on the book of Malachi. Uh, if you, it'd be helpful if you've got it open and you can follow along. Um, and I know that when you hit Malachi, we're in the minor prophets, and this is kind of like in your Bible, this is the flyover territory, right? This is uh, the, the bit that we tend to breeze right over, but basically it's the last book of the Old Testament. So go to Matthew and take a left and you'll find Malachi. If you're having trouble finding it, just honk your horn and Ty will come running over and <laughs> give you a hand. <laughs> Actually, I did want to take a moment to um, maybe get you oriented with your Old Testament because it dawns on me that when we hit something like Malachi, these are the books that, that it's really easy to breeze right through or maybe not even ever touch and you really don't know where it is or or how this part of your Old Testament is uh, organized. So I thought I'd just take a moment to do kind of one of those um, mall maps, you know, the you are here dot inside the mall that helps you understand where you are. Let me just give you a, a brief summary of how your Old Testament is organized, just so that you know uh, what Malachi is doing, where it is, why it's there. And so far I've managed to say Malachi each time without saying Malachi, which is my major temptation. but. <laughs> Except I just did it. Well, anyhow, um, so you know, you know your Bible is divided between your Old Testament and your New Testament. Everything before Jesus and your Old Testament, the Old Testament Bible written in Hebrew, and then your New Testament from Jesus' life through the apostles in Greek uh, to the right of that. In the Old Testament, it's interesting that um, Jews uh, now refer to, they refer to the Old Testament as the Hebrew Bible. They don't want to say Old Testament because that implies that there's a New Testament. So they'll call it the Hebrew Bible. We call it the Old Testament. But it's divided in the traditional Jewish um, divisions. They refer to the, the Old Testament as the Tanakh. They'll call it the Hebrew Bible or the Tanakh. And Tanakh stands for the Torah, the Navim, and the Ketuvim. Uh, the Torah is the law. The Navim are the prophets. And the Ketuvim are the writings. So you know that your first five books, that's the Torah. Um, the prophets. And then the writings would be like Psalms, Proverbs, uh, those, those books. The so we're going to look at the prophets for a moment, the, the Navim. And the, the, the Navim, the prophets, they're divided in half as well. There's the former prophets and the latter prophets. Now, it's surprising. You'll, you'll be surprised. The former prophets are actually Joshua, Judges, Samuel, and the kings. They considered them former prophets. And then the latter prophets are uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, on. 
So we're in the latter prophets then, if we're in Malachi. Um, and, and the latter prophets, that's divided in half as well. So you've got the major prophets and the minor prophets. The major prophets are Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, the big, the big prophets. And they, they kind of stand by themselves because when you would get a book of uh, Jeremiah, that would be one scroll, or Ezekiel would be one scroll. But when you hit the minor prophets, they're minor because they're smaller. They're very short. And they, they referred to the minor prophets, they called it the book of the 12, because all 12 minor prophets could fit on one scroll. So you would have uh, your Jeremiah, your Ezekiel, and then your book of the 12, which is the minor prophets, the little ones right at the very end of the Old Testament. And then we can divide those minor prophets one more time. The first nine of the minor prophets, starting at uh, Hosea, because Daniel is considered one of the writings, from Hosea on, the first nine are pre-exilic, meaning these were prophets that ministered before Israel was taken away in the Babylonian captivity. Then the last three, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, those last three of the minor prophets are considered post-exilic, meaning these three minor prophets were acting as prophets after Israel came back from the exile. So you know you've got the Babylonian captivity with the history of Israel under the kings before that and all the other prophets prophesied to that group. Then you've got them going away to Babylon and then they come back and that's when Ezra and Nehemiah are describing the rebuilding of the temple and the building of the walls. The three last minor prophets prophesied to that group. So that's how you divide up the minor prophets. So with that, now you kind of get a little bit of a sense of where we are when we come to the book of Malachi. We're in one of the minor prophets, and we're in the post-exilic period, meaning these are guys that are prophesying and ministering to Israel after they've come back from Babylon and have started rebuilding the temple. So, so Malachi then is the prophet, and he's writing somewhere around 500 to 490 B.C. Okay, so 500 to 490 B.C., his audience is then that small band of Israelites who had returned to Jerusalem to rebuild the city and the temple at the end of the Babylonian captivity. You know, your book of Daniel, you've got them away in Babylon, and then at the very end, Cyrus from Persia takes over and he sends a, a band of Israelites back to rebuild. And so that's who he's speaking to is that little group. Um, they rebuilt the temple in Ezra, and they rebuilt the wall around Jerusalem in Nehemiah. And, he, and it's interesting because when you, when you situate it like that and you think about, okay, so these are the people he's writing to, then that right away you get kind of a, a sense of what these people must have been like. Because Israel had, had gone to Babylon and they had been there for 70 years. And during that time they were told to, to dig in, to build houses, to plant gardens, to seek the peace of the city, to just settle down and get used to this because it's going to be a little while. And they, they did that, and the Jews in Babylon prospered. They grew wealthy. They built great homes. They became successful financially, and they really settled in. It's, it's really interesting. If you, if you study Jewish history, you'll see that like, the influence on, of Babylon on the Jews remains powerful. The language of Babylon becomes the language of Jews, even some of them back in Palestine. That's the language they're using. And even uh, early in the medieval era, you'll find that when the Jews are writing their, um, their, their liturgy and their worship, um, like thing, books like the Talmud, that's going to have a Babylonian flavor to it because that, that group that went there, when Israel settled in, they really were thriving and they became at home. Many of them were brought into the Babylonian military, were used as mercenaries all around uh, the Babylonian empire, and they were thriving. So then, so then Cyrus comes along with Persia, conquers Babylon, and he comes and he says, okay, I'm going to give you money so you can go back and rebuild the temple. And so if you're one of the people that decides, I'm going to go back with this group to rebuild the temple, you're someone who is deliberately choosing to leave your career, your home, your family, your synagogue, your church community that you have settled in with, so your life as you know it for three generations 
is all settled into this place. And for some reason, you're going to get up and go to a place where we find out the surrounding nations are going to be hostile. They're going to be attacking you at all time. And in fact, as you try to build, you're going to have to hold, hold your, your shovel in one hand and your sword in the other as you seek to defend yourself while you're trying to rebuild this city. So you have to realize that the people that, um, that Malachi is speaking to are people who at one time were very, very committed to wanting to glorify God and honor him by rebuilding the temple and restoring worship to Jerusalem. These are the most zealous of all the Jews that you could find and most committed, most prepared to abandon everything, to lose everything in order to come over here to serve God. They left wealth, family, synagogue safety. They took great risk and, they were, and the motivation to do so was to glorify God by rebuilding his city and his temple. So these were very serious Jews. And yet, over the course of the book of Malachi, he describes a people that are weary. Their, their, um, their zeal is gone. They're weary. They've lost their sense that this is something special and unique. They're forlorn, and they have, they're sort of disillusioned with their cause. And also, we find out that they've become deeply, deeply compromised. Over the next uh, few weeks, we're going to see Malachi walk through the sins that he sees in this people, and we're going to find out that there was serious sin, serious compromise that had crept in to these Israelites. They are duplicitous and insincere in their worship. They are hard-hearted in how they treat their families, and they've grown discouraged in their faith. How strange that this group would struggle with those sins, with the people that would that had so self-selected to be the most serious and committed of the Jews could be so compromised in those ways. So Malachi comes to them then with a burden from the Lord. That's how he introduces this in verse 1. The burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. The burden there is this message that he has and has a sense of he's he's carrying something heavy that he has to come and, and deliver to them. So, um, so he comes with his burden from the Lord, a prophecy or an oracle that he needs to deliver to them. Now, the, the book of Malachi is broken up into basically six different charges or little sections where he has a message that he wants to uh, deliver to them. And so, although there are four chapters to the book of Malachi, we're going to consider it in six different sections as we work through the text. Um, And chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, which I just read, that's the first section of of Malachi's burden. And in this section, Malachi brings a charge from God against Israel that, that, I'll read it here. He says, I have loved you, says the Lord, yet you say, in what way have you loved us? I have loved you, says the Lord, yet you say, "In, in what way have you loved us? It has, it has the sense of God is saying, I, I have loved you. And it's, um, it's past tense, but that's not to say it's a thing that, has, um, that is completed and not happening anymore. He, the, the sense is it is definitive and accomplished, and, and, and the evidence of it is all around them. This is, I have given you this, and it's, it's right there. My love has been given to you. And yet their answer is, we don't see it. God God says, I've given this to you, but you don't believe it. You don't acknowledge, you don't understand or have confidence that I have loved you, even though I have given you so much. So so to understand that, let's let's go back just a a ways. I'm going to go back to the Torah. Um, So if you can turn to Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 7, and listen to this. This is Moses giving God's word to Israel. Deuteronomy 7, verses 6 through 8. You are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples in the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love on you nor choose you because you are more in number than any other people, for you are the least of all peoples. But, but because the Lord loves you and because he would keep the oath which he swore to your fathers, the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of bondage, from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Here, Moses is walking through with the Israelites an understanding of why it is that they are God's people, how it is that they got to be in this place. 
And he tells them that, that you need to notice that God's love is rooted in his choice. Look at verse 7 again. Lord did not set his love on you nor choose you because you were more in number than any other people. For you were the least of all peoples. So the Lord did not love you or choose you. God's, um, God's love for you is rooted in his choice, his decision, his determination. And in fact, if you look at that for a moment, you'll see that those two words, his love and his choice, are being used synonymously. He, he, can, use, he can use either word and it means the same thing. He loves you. He chose you. Okay? His love is his determination to have a commitment to you. There, there are synonyms there. They're used equivalents, as equivalents of one another. And, and he, spe- he, he especially points out, or, or I should say, he removes from speculation what we tend to think is the motivation for God's love. He says in, in verse 7, Lord did not lo- set his love on you nor choose you because you were more in number than any other people, for you were the least of all peoples. In other words, he says, his love for you is not rooted in your worthiness. His love for you is not, root, it's not motivated by what you brought to the deal. Um, he, he, in fact, if we were to look at you, we would see that you had nothing to, to bring to him. You, supplied, you were the least of all people. So it couldn't, his, the motivation for his love couldn't reside in you. The motivation for his love was his choice, his sovereign determination to bring you out and to give you something. It was, look at verse 8 again here. But because the Lord loves you, right? So, so why, why did he dis- choose you? Not because of what you brought, not because you were the greatest of all people, but simply because he loves you. It's almost begging the question. He's saying he chose you because he loves you. He loves you because he chose you. They're the same thing. Because the Lord loves you and because he would keep the oath which he swore to your fathers, that's why the Lord has brought you out. He makes a determination and then he stays consistent and faithful to his determination. When he determines something, his will cannot be changed. He's not fickle. He doesn't change his mind tomorrow. If it was rooted in you, you change all the time. You do stupid things all the time. You, you change over time and become a different person all the time. If it was rooted in you, his feeling, his affection towards you would be shifting as you change. But it's not. It's, deter- it's, de- it's based on his decision, which is eternal and certain. And therefore, you, you can have confidence in it. It was his determination that motivated the love. And that determination of God to love you should notice, is a pledge. It is a promise. Verse 9. Therefore, know that the Lord your God, he is God, the faithful God who keeps covenant and mercy for a thousand generations with those who love him and keep his commandments. So the certainty of God's determination here is founded on the nature of his character. He says, therefore, know that the Lord your God And he's going to describe for us now what God is like. God is God, and he is the God, the faithful God, who keeps his covenant. Who, who, when he makes a promise, he holds it, and he does not change. So you see how God's love for Israel is entirely rooted in himself and his own character and his own nature. It's his determination to love God, and that determination stays solid because God does not change. And he specifically tells them, it wasn't something in you that made me single you out. You weren't the wittiest. You weren't the cutest. You weren't the cleverest. You weren't the strongest. It was none of those things. It was my determination. That's why Israel has been chosen. And this, this, um, the way God is acting here is a revelation of his character, of what he is like. So again, if you want to know about Israel's election you don't look to Israel, you look to God. If you want to know about God's favor for them, it's, it's a part of his character, not a part of theirs. So God has loved Israel, pledged his covenant faithfulness to Israel. And you notice this is in Reformed communities, we always use that word covenant all the time. Everything is named covenant something, right? And, and this is why, because the covenant is when God makes a a promise to someone, when he makes his oath to someone. And that covenant is a revelation of what he is like. 
And all of our security is wrapped up in the faithfulness of God to his covenant. That's why that, that word is so important to us. And God has loved Israel, pledged his covenant faithfulness to Israel, and yet Israel has responded with disbelief. You see, that's why in, in, in Malachi, there, it's so alarming that, that, that this is how Israel would speak back to God. God says, I have loved you. And they say, prove it. Show me how, where. I don't see it. Okay, you see how, why that is such an alarming response to God's sovereign covenant love. Uh, they answer and they say, in what way have you loved us? The Israelites were looking around them and thought that they could see no proof of God's love. And it's shocking that they, that they at this moment could say, there's nothing here, no grace, no mercy. We don't see it. We don't see proof of your love and affection to us. No evidence of God's kindness. And right there you realize that, in, that Israel at this moment has slipped into a very deep hard-heartedness. Right? They are not understanding who their God is or what he has done for them. This is, it's so strange because it's like you have, we, we know the story of the Israelites in the wilderness and their constant hard-heartedness where God will show them his love, his deliverance, and then two seconds later they're saying, we think he's abandoned us, we think he's left us. And he has to keep rebuking them and correcting them to show them his character is the one, he's the God who does not leave, he's the God who does not forsake, he doesn't walk away. And now here you've got the Israelites who have been delivered from the Babylonian captivity, brought back to Israel, and even there, standing in that situation, they're tempted to say, we don't see God's goodness. Give me some proof. Now it's interesting, I think, the contrast between God's love and Israel's response. Because think about it this way. God's love comes along without any regard to the worthiness of the object of his love. Okay, his, his love comes completely from him and not from the worthiness of the object that he loves. God's love bestows loveliness. It doesn't respond to loveliness. When, when God loves, he makes the thing lovely. He doesn't come to it because it was lovely. His, his love is causative. It's not responsive. He's the, he's the one that imparts that, that lov loveliness. So God's loving without any worthiness in the object. But contrast that for a moment with Israel's response. Um, Israel hears about God's love and says, show me some proof. I need proof. Isn't, isn't that so, so different? Where God can, can love with nothing there and make it lovely, and they can have all that love around them, and they still can't see any proof or any evidence. This is their hard-heartedness. And so... God, in his kindness to them and his long-suffering with them, begins to give them proof. He begins to slowly and patiently walk them through and show them his love all around them. He gives them proof. And the first thing he does is he takes them back to Jacob and Esau, the story of Jacob and Esau. Remember that Jacob is the beginning of the nation of Israel. And he takes the Israelites back to that story. They were twin brothers. And it, it's interesting in, um, I think, in ancient, um, uh, ancient cultures and ancient philosophy, twins are always this kind of really interesting um, problem. Because in a lot of the ancient uh, philosophies and religions, you have this idea that, that your future is, a, um, is dictated and controlled by the stars and whatnot. And the way, uh, the way you get brought into the machinery of the heavens is the moment that you're born the, the, the signs, you know, the stars and their alignment that are, that are in existence as you're born, that becomes sort of the, the dictation of your future. That's why people have, you know, your zodiac, if you're a, uh, depending on what month you're born in, you're supposed to be a certain sign, and then that's supposed to dictate what your future will be or what will happen to you this week. Well, that all goes back to this pagan idea that there was this fate that was dictated by when you were born. And, but the, the problem was is that you could point to twins who were supposed to be born at the same time, and then they would have radically different lives. And so you'll find in pagan philosophy that twins are always this kind of like real threat to their understanding of the way the world is supposed to work. And, and God takes twins at the very beginning of Israel to show that it's not the zodiac of the stars. There is something else 
that is powerful, that is controlling our lives. We do something similar with DNA, right? We, we think that you have this, this blueprint in your DNA that is fatalistic, that determines your future no matter what, that you will have to act out your DNA, that you were born this way and therefore you have to be this way. Again, the twins will, will, will prove that that just doesn't quite work. You can have people with the same DNA and yet they end up with very different stories. So God gives proof to Israel of what his favor looks like. And he goes back to twins and he says, I'll show you what it looks like when I have mercy. He says, take Jacob and Esau, um, take those two and, and look at God's sovereignty in choosing, his sovereignty in election, in making a choice. We, it's interesting, Malachi 1 is, is quoted uh, by Paul when he's trying to make the same argument in Romans chapter 9. Romans 9, verses 10 through 13. Not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one man, even by our father Isaac, for the children not yet being born, not, nor having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God, according to election, might stand, not of works, but of him who calls. It was said to her, the older shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I have loved, and Esau I have hated. That last line he's quoting now from our text in Malachi. And Paul's, Paul is telling us, look, you had Jacob and you had Esau, and when they were in the womb, before they had done anything, before they had demonstrated any worthiness of character or anything, in order that you could see it was the sovereignty of God in election, that's when it was said, the older will serve the younger. And you see there that, that Paul is doing the same thing that, that Moses did back in Deuteronomy, where he says, look, there is no worthiness in Israel. It wasn't because you were great. Paul says, look, this determination was made before Jacob and Esau had done anything. So, so their character, their achievements, their um, impressive qualities, those were not in view. Those had no bearing on the determination. The determination all was in God. It was in the character of God. He made that determination that the older would serve the younger. Um, and so it is, it is then, um, as, as I had said back earlier with a bit from Deuteronomy, it is, God's, it is part of God's character to act like this. So the doctrine that God chooses without regard to our worthiness, uh, this doctrine of God's sovereign election, is offensive, right? It, it is offensive. I remember hearing it myself and just having it really, um, really turned me sideways. And I just found it so revolting. And, you, and, I, and the idea that, that, that God's sovereign will is the thing that caused me to love him and not my determination to love him, that just really rankled me. But what I found was, as I dug into it more and more and more, was that a, a couple of things. First of all, the realization that this is the very definition of mercy. This is the very definition of grace. We, we, de we define grace and mercy as unmerited favor, when God gives you something that you did not earn. And as, as Protestants, we're, you know, evangelical Protestants, I was raised from the very beginning always saying, it is not, salvation is not by works, it's a gift. It is not anything I do, it's a gift, it's a gift, it's a gift. It's mercy, it's mercy, it's mercy. Until somebody comes along and says, right, you didn't do anything. God just came along and gave it to you. And then suddenly you say, wait a minute, I don't, I don't, I don't like the sound of that at all. But it is, it is strange to me how this is the teaching that is actually behind our entire conception of the gospel. And yet when we come and we look at it, and we look at it up close, it really can be very hard on our pride. Because we always want to back up and find something in ourselves, Something in me that made me so special, that made God look at me and say, that one, that kid in Boise playing with the Legos, you know, I'm going to pour out my grace on him, that there was something in me that, that, that brought that grace down as opposed to my neighbor. But, but the thing is, is if there's anything in me, it's works, and it's dependent upon me. It is grace is when God gives something that was a pure and total gift. And I think the reason why it's, it's unsettling is because you realize how terrifying it is that your um, your salvation is it rests entirely on God. 
that, that you, you just, you could have easily been someone who was an object of wrath, who, who did not have God's grace in your life. It's terrifying to think that you want to claim something so that you have some sort of card in your pocket to say, no, 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 this belonged to me by right. It can't go somewhere else. But no, we, we always, um, you know, we have all these little evangelical cliches like, uh, there but for the grace of God go I. Well, take that seriously for the moment. All right, there but for the grace of God go I. If, if it, it is only the grace of God that has brought me to where I am, then I did nothing. There was nothing in me. It was, it was all in God, in his character, in his decision. And it is, it is devastating because it makes you realize this is nothing you did. This is something that God, out of nowhere, just decided to pour out his mercy on you in order to reveal his character of what grace and mercy and love looks like, and you brought nothing to this. And it's terrifying, and yet at the same time, when you start to actually comprehend it and, and submit yourself to the clear words of Scripture, you find tremendous relief. And you, you've, you've suddenly the largeness of God explodes in your mind. And what you thought he once was, you realize he is so much more, and he has given you so much more. And it helps you to see the glory of who God is. And second, I think the other thing that we, we, tend, to, um, we, we tend to get nervous about this doctrine is it feels, um, it feels fickle, doesn't it? It feels arbitrary. It feels like, well, it, it feels like somebody's just playing eeny, meeny, miny, mo, right? And, and, and so, so how can you have confidence in something that is fickle and arbitrary. But you need to turn it around for a moment and, and, and realize the question is, is salvation something that you, a switch that you turned on or is a switch that God turned on? Is it something that you did in order to bring God to you or is it something that God is coming to you to give to you? If it is something that you did, if it's a switch that you turned on, be honest with yourself. We all know your stability. We all know your ability to be fickle. I mean, between the two of you, we, we, let's, let's set up you here and then the sovereign God there. Which one is more likely to be fickle, right? Which one is, is more likely to change his mind tomorrow and be something different tomorrow? If, if salvation is a cup that you need to hold, you know for certain, for certain, you will spill it. You will lose it. It'll fall over your hand because you're not capable of holding on to it. But if salvation is something that God himself is bringing to you, suddenly it's something you can rest in. Right? Remember I said that, that his love and his choice are, are all tied together. They're, they're the same thing. And they're the revelation of his eternal and perfect and certain character. They're a revelation of just what he's like. He's the covenant-keeping God. So if it's all his brought to you, then suddenly this is something you can relax in. You, you, you can actually have confidence in. You can have peace in. And it's something we can talk about um, hopefully later on, but, but one of the things you'll note in Scripture is God's delight in having a confident people. God, God loves to have people who are confident of his love for them. I think it's why he's coming to rebuke the Jews here in Malachi, because they've lost the confidence in, in their salvation. And that's not a loss in themselves. It's a loss in their understanding of what God is like, uh, that, of what his character is like, to think that he had turned on them. So he, he takes us to the story of Jacob and Esau. And then he continues on. So how, how can we see proof of your love? God could simply point out what it looks like to not receive his love. Look at verse 4. Even though Edom has said, we have been impoverished, but we will return and build the desolate places, thus says the Lord of hosts, they may build, but I will throw down. They shall be called the territory of wickedness and the people against whom the Lord will have indignation forever. From Esau descended the nation of Edom, which remained an enemy of Israel. Uh, Edom was a small nation just southeast of the Dead Sea. It lived on the border of Israel and had become a terrible uh, enemy to the nation of Israel. When, uh, when the Babylonians had carried Israel away captive 70 years before, uh, we know that the Edomites had actually come and helped the Babylonians to plunder Jerusalem. 
So they'd been sitting on the border of their brother's territory. And when their brother's enemy came and attacked them, they joined with their brother's enemy. And as the Babylonians took them away, the Edomites went in and actually plundered the cities of of Israel and Jerusalem and took over a number of the villages. That's what the book of Obadiah uh, is about. So when you read Obadiah, it's just one chapter, and it's God's judgment on Edom for the way they joined with the Babylonians to plunder uh, Israel. It's also, uh, if you remember Psalm 137, one of the more gruesome and disturbing psalms that describes the, um, the psalmist praying for the enemies of God to be overwhelmed, and it's particularly the Edomites that they want to be destroyed. And it's because the Edomites had joined in Babylon to plunder Jerusalem. And so even though Edom boasted that they would build their nation up, God promised Israel that they will see Edom destroyed with their own eyes. It will be made a habitation for the wild beasts in verse 3. I think if you have a King James, I'm not sure on this, but I think it might say dragons there. The word there is an old Hebrew word for these beasts that are going to inhabit the area. So here they are back in Jerusalem with the temple rebuilt, the walls rebuilt. They see God's judgment on Edom right next door who had once plundered their city. And Edom is about to be struck down. God's judgment is against them. So so why are they asking this question? They've been brought back to their city. Their enemies are being overthrown. Why would they have this question? But I'd say put yourself in this situation for a moment. Or maybe you already are. I mean, I think if you, if you think about that description I had of the, of the um, Israelites who had returned to, um, to Israel during this time, it, honestly, there's actually a lot of parallels for probably a number of the stories that are here. Um, you have, um, why are you here in Moscow? Uh, many of you traveled here in order to be a part of a community. Right, a lot of you, a lot of you said, um, "I want to be in a place that takes uh, education seriously, that takes family seriously, that takes worship seriously." I want to, and and there are all these different reasons why you might have said, "You know what? We're going to move. We're going to move to Moscow." Our our congregation is uh, definitely dominated by people who are not from Moscow originally, but moved to be a part of the community, and that means you traveled. It means you you left jobs. You left money, you, you left houses that you built, that you worked on, that you saved up for, and then sold in order to get here. Uh, you left um, churches, you left uh, family, you left things that you knew in order to travel to be a part of this community. But the thing is, and this is the, the, the realization you've got to have, is that wherever you go, wherever you go, there you are. And, and we have this mythology that changing your geography, changing your location, will somehow make things easier. If I'm, it's hard to obey here, but if I move over to there, suddenly everything will be a lot easier. It's hard to obey in this church, but if I was in that church, it would all be a lot easier. But what you find out is that your difficulties don't come from the externals. They come from the internals. And you, you, it's, it's not the community. It's your heart. And wherever you go, there you are. Wherever you go, there your heart is. Is and it brings with it all the same problems. Let me read an excerpt for a moment from. I wouldn't normally do this, but I think it's just too uh, too poignant. Um, the pagan philosopher Seneca, first century uh, pagan philosopher, Stoic, who who wrote this essay on travel and and in his realization about the what people think travel will do and how little it does that. Let me just read a couple paragraphs from it. He says, "What good has travel of itself ever been to been able to do anyone?" It has never acted as a check on pleasure or a restraining influence on desire. It has never controlled the temper of an angry man or quelled the reckless impulses of a lover. Never, in fact, (coughs) has it rid the personality of a fault. It has not granted us the gift of judgment. It has not put an end to mistaken attitudes. All it has ever done is distract us for a little while through the novelty of our surroundings, like children fascinated by something they haven't come across before. The instability, moreover, of a mind which is seriously unwell is aggravated by it, the motion itself increasing the fitfulness and restlessness. This explains why people, after setting out for a place with the greatest of enthusiasm, are are often more enthusiastic about getting away from it, like migrant birds they fly on, away even quicker than they came. Suppose someone has a broken leg or dislocated joint. He doesn't get into a carriage or board a ship. He calls in a doctor to have the fracture set or the dislocation reduced. Well then, when a person's spirit is wrenched or broken at so many points, do you imagine that it can be put right by a change of scenery? 
that this sort of trouble isn't so serious that it can't be cured by an outing? Does it surprise you that running away doesn't do you any good? The things you're running away from are with you all the time. In other words, he says, wherever you go, there you are. And if you have a broken heart, going on a bus ride won't do anything for it. You have to deal with the heart. So here, here you are. Here you are, and you are tempted, perhaps, to, to ask the same questions that the Israelites in Malachi's time asked. In what way, God, have you loved me? Do you feel that, that temptation sometimes to wonder, in what way is God showing his favor on you? All right? how, how do you know God has loved you? How can, you, how can I see that you have, been, you have placed your covenant love on me? And the answer is, well, you're here. You're, you're here. You're right here. You're here at church worshiping God. And you wouldn't be if he didn't love you. All right? you're, you're here. He has called you, and you're here to worship him. That shows you that he is, his love is at work in your heart because it doesn't depend on you. It depends on him. Um, listen, David wrestles with this in Psalm 73 in a way that I think is very applicable. Psalm 73 I won't do the whole psalm, but just a a couple of verses to note. The first three verses, he says, Truly God is good to Israel, to such as are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped, for I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Here this is Asaph who's writing this psalm, and and he's identifying something that I think is quite common, where you you obey God, and you, you do what you're supposed to do, and you, um, you make the sacrifices that you thought you were supposed to make. You moved, you sacrificed to give an education to your kids, you read all the right books, you did all the, you do all the things, and then all of a sudden you look around and you see other people thriving in ways that you wish that you were. And you, you, you become, you look sidelong, you look to the left, you look to the right, and you see these lives, and you, they're the lives that you wish that you had, and you feel like, well, it, is it not working then? Because I did all the things I'm supposed to do, and yet these are the people that are prospering, and I don't see myself prospering. It's this envy that starts to creep in and suck away your joy. But, the, but Asaph continues, and, and in, in verse 13, it starts to get really bad. He says, Surely I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocence, for all day long I've been plagued and chastened every morning. He says, Surely in vain I've done all these things. I, I've, I've tried to be faithful. I've been obedient. And it's all in vain because my life is not like their lives. It's not the life that I want to have. But then suddenly he wakes up and he, and he, sees, he sees the answer. When I thought how to understand this, it was too painful me, too painful for me. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood their end. And he, so you, he, and he has this massive churn, and the rest of the psalm is a very different flavor. But it's really interesting, the moment that he turns is the moment that he comes in to worship. And I would say, it's not just that he's in the, you know, he's, he's in the congregation, it's the act of worship is the act of pointing your eyes towards God. It's the act of point, lifting your gaze up and quit li- looking to the left and to the right and looking at your circumstances and looking at all these things, these unfair comparisons that you make and these temptations that well over you. Instead, he lifts his eye up and he looks to God. He looks to God and suddenly when he sees that, all the questions just fall away. And he says, I, I, I was stupid. I was stupid to even have these questions. As soon as he turns and he looks to God, because remember, our salvation is rooted in, in who God is. It's his determination and his love are all tied up with one another, and it's him exerting that on us. And when we turn and we just look up to God, which is what we do in worship, all these questions just fall away. Uh, You you think of um, Peter at the end. uh, It's after Jesus' resurrection when he's out with with Jesus, and he he points to John, and he says, you know, the rumor is that he's not going to taste death. And, And Jesus says, what is that to you? Follow me. Quit, quit looking at that story and at that story. Yes, he has one path to walk and you have a different path to walk. His obedience leads him to one place. Your obedience leads you to another place. But all of them come back to me. 
and you just need to have your eyes on God. You, you look your, lift up your eyes to Christ, and you see him, and you see his love. You see his determination. You see his incredible grace that came in and gave you what you never had any right to. And that overwhelms you, and it pushes out every other competing thought. Every temptation, every frustration, every little complaint is pushed out when you understand the magnificence of God's grace for you. So it is when you see that God has called you out to worship him, and you can actually look at him and see his grace to you. You see his hand on you, his covenant love for you, the fact that he makes that kind of determination and then holds on to it no matter how fickle you are. When you see that, and you see the unmerited favor that God has for you, that is what you see when you come to worship him. And that is why it is so wonderful for us to all be back together again. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, you are the covenant-keeping God. It is so fitting that you created the world by your word, because now we see the power and certainty of your words. When you, when you make a covenant, that thing is firm and certain. And when we stand on this earth, we stand on your word. And when we stand in our salvation, we stand in your word. Father, we thank you for this certainty. We thank you for this confidence. May we glorify you with certainty in your promise of salvation. And so we pray as your son taught us to pray, saying, uh, A Scottish minister, Robert Murray McShane, once, once said, The question isn't, am I elect? The question is, am I a sinner? And am I a sinner that's looked to Christ for salvation? And if that's the case then you stand by grace. And if you stand by grace, then you can face pestilence, you can face financial turmoil, you can face whatever may come because you stand by God's grace alone. Uh, the doctrine of election is only offensive to the proud. It's only offensive to those that want to take some credit for things. But to the humble, it's a sweet reminder that God, if God hadn't chosen you, if God hadn't chosen you, you would never have come. So receive the benediction of the Lord. Now our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which hath loved us and hath given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. And amen.